afternoon. It's nice to see everyone. Thank you for attending our session. So the goal of urban flight infrastructure considerations for AAM is that we're trying as a group to impart lessons we've learned for the UAM ecosystem regarding ground infrastructure. And that's something that all of the panelists and myself share. And we're looking at issues we're currently facing and trying to make solutions real time. So this is a rapidly emerging technology and a very exciting time to be in research and development. So I want to introduce our panelists. We have Alex Argruden, who just was on the stage just a moment ago. She's the chief executive officer of the Miami Parking Authority. It's the largest authority in the state for parking. She's responsible for the agency managing over 46,000 parking spaces and an operating budget of $40 million. Under her leadership, the MPA was one of only five organizations that attained the accredited parking designation from the International Institute. Welcome. John Luria, our next speaker, is the senior vice president at City. He's a member of City's broader industrials franchise and is based in New York City. He and his team lead the U.S. Commercial Bank Industrial Disruptor segment. And his portfolio includes electric and autonomous vehicle ecosystem, industrial robotics and technology, and of course, EVATOLs and space. Um, very exciting welcome. Adrian Lindgren leads the city activation team at Supernal. Adrian is an urban planner and economic development professional with a focus on integrating advanced transportation systems into the built environment and enhance our urban and regional mobility. Adrian serves as the head of the activation team and in her capacity, she partners with entities across the, across the globe um, and to better understand UAM technology. Welcome. And, and we also have Rolando Tapanis, who's the head of business development at Fervial. And Rolando has a passion for improving local communities. He plays a key role in Ferrovial's vision for transforming the future of mobility with the Vertiport. Um, including networks that make sustainable, convenient evitals uh, for air transportation in our congested cities. So, welcome. So, just to kick us off in our limited time together, it's pretty clear we all share this interest in ways to foster sustainable advanced air mobility in our cities. Uh, with that, my first question is actually for Alex as a local, um, just kick us off and tell us about what the city of Miami has been doing in terms of infrastructure planning and the projects that involve UAM. Well, thank you. Thank you all for being here today. The mayor gave me a good plug, so I was happy about that. Um, we are absolutely um, excited to be here and to be talking about this topic. Um, before anybody knew really what this topic was all about, about three years ago when the pandemic was in, in, right in its midst, uh, we started having conversations with a uh, vertiport operator and, and some various OEM um, operators, and we were looking at sites in Miami and what it took, and it was kind of trying to get to understand what does this mean for us. And it's almost like, I always, I always say this, and I know some people cringe, but it's like the Jetsons. I, we're actually going to go into being in the, in the people who understand the Jetsons, my kids have no idea what the Jetsons are. Um, um, but, but it's interesting that we're actually gonna be here. And I do think that in our lifetime, we're going to see that. And so I do think that this city, city of Miami, it's important for us to have a footprint and be one of the first to have a footprint um, for these OEMs and a, a means of transportation, a different means of transportation that will take people from point A to point B. Um, and so we have been looking at different sites in the city of Miami. I just had a side conversation with the mayor asking him, you know, I, we need support also um, from our politicians to build this site and make sure that we can integrate. You know, I, I, I'm from the parking authority, so I, I'm on the parking side providing public parking. And having an integration with maybe a vertiport operator would be a great fit for us to have maybe a multimodal station where I could park public vehicles and also provide a vertiport for these types of, um, of aircrafts. So we are very excited. Um, we do have a couple of places in the city that we think we could be at. 
and um, we look forward to working uh, with the, the companies to do that. I think providing that public purpose is going to be important. Wonderful. And Rolando, I know that the company Ferroviol has been involved in many of the Miami-Dade um, UAM efforts. Could you tell us a bit about that? Well, well, definitely. So first of all, thank you all for being here. And uh, I want to take the opportunity as a lifelong Miami resident and uh, resident of Miami-Dade County to say that the promise of high speed, zero emission transportation in my city is really particularly gratifying. I, along with all my ferrovial partners, are really excited um, that we are planning a first of its kind vertiport network here in the state of Florida. Um, we continue to engage with our you know, local policyholders, community groups, uh, with our industry partners, whether they be OEMs, uh, eVTOL uh, manufacturers, or airlines. Uh, we are working ardently on our safe selection and analysis process. Um, but given that we are at Commotion Miami and we are in Miami, I think it's important to highlight Miami. So Miami, I think most of us can agree, is an incredibly vibrant community. Um, the mayor was on before us. Uh, we've proven that we have incredible financial resiliency. Um, for those of us that live here, and for those of you that are visiting, I'm sure you can all agree that we could use some additional modes of transportation. So I think for all those reasons, Miami is an ideal location for us to include within our network in Florida. Um, so Ferrovial has a very specific, world renowned skill set, given the fact that they are uh, a leader in infrastructure and transportation worldwide. We've been doing uh, incredible amounts of uh, modeling and analysis to make sure that these are sited in the most effective and efficient locations. And um, we you know, are excited about bringing this to Miami. Alex has been uh, always open to conversations and she's definitely a great collaborative partner and, and we are open to any viable options that she might have. And uh, I think the biggest lesson uh, through this whole process is that we as an infrastructure partner must be an attentive partner. And by that means we have to be open to the community that we seek to build these in, speak to all the leaders, the policyholders, all the, the stakeholders to make sure that we are creative, that we're bringing benefit. And if we do that, I think we can allay any concerns that might be with regards to this new but very exciting uh, uh, mode of transportation in our area. Fantastic. Now, Evitol and the infrastructure, the Vertiport for it, are grand plans. So it's, it's very nice to have a representative from Citibank. John, how do we finance this? Uh, I, I think it's a tough question, but why don't I start by just thanking everyone for having me, uh, especially the Comotion folks. Um, I think to answer that question, you have to kind of think about what evolution looks like here. So maybe I could dive into that for a little bit. Um, I, I think that originally, initially that EV tolls will probably be, uh, like murder ports will be set up on existing infrastructure assets like on airports. Because if you think about it, that's really the, the path of least resistance when it comes to air traffic, when it comes to um, battery recharging, and that's where people and goods flow through already. So it's kind of natural. Um, second, um, you know, that in and of itself won't solve what e VTOL is trying to deliver, right? I mean, you could take a jet to LaGuardia and get to Midtown in 45 minutes. E VTOL wants to get you to Midtown Manhattan, so you disembark and you are at your destination. So to get to that TAM, you need more vertiports, you need more access into densely urban areas or into areas that people want to travel to. So I think the next wave of that is really going to come from uh, a repurposing of existing infrastructure assets, uh, or excuse me, not infrastructure assets, repurposing existing assets into infrastructure assets. And what, what do I mean by that? Take a parking lot, take a casino roof, take the base of a ski area. These are all, among many other um, potential vertiport locations. What you don't have there in the challenge of that second wave, in my opinion, is you don't have the charging infrastructure. So I view these as an interim stop. Um, you know, 
drop off passengers, potentially pick them up, and return to the infrastructure assets that have charging capabilities. The third wave, which is the most complicated, um, is how do you really penetrate dense urban areas, the Manhattans, the downtown Miamis? Um, and I think that's a private uh, public partnership to, to a degree. Um, I think that's a lot tougher. I see those being hubs where you can recharge. I see those being, um, you know, uh, smaller airport style infrastructure that offer concessions and things like that uh, and, and um, are multi-pad so you can get multiple aircraft in there. How that evolves, I don't know. Now, to your original question of when do banks step in and finance these assets, uh, I will say that banks can play a role here, but extending balance sheet is probably pretty far away because it's just, um, as bank risk appetites go, still pretty speculative. So I, I don't see banks playing an immediate balance sheet extension role for the development of new assets. When it comes to repurposing assets, if you have a parking garage, let's say, with and you want to repurpose the top floor to be a landing pad, that parking garage already has cash flows. So that's what's needed to repay debt. That's what gets banks comfortable. Um, so I, I can see if there is capacity for debt from a cash flow perspective, balance sheet lenders coming in and lending a hand for repurposing. Um, when it comes to building brand new infrastructure assets, because we're unclear of where cash flows are going to come from, whether they are landing fees, whether they are concessions and things like that, I think those investments are first going to come from a strategic nature. So that's going to be United saying, hey, this benefits me a lot. Could be some city investment in that also because arguably bringing traffic into a city can help the tax base. Um, other incentives the city may have for bringing in tourism. Um, so I, I, I don't know how that's going to go. I think the role banks play there are they can act as broker and organize debt or equity in the private or public markets and bring investors together. So that's uh, my long-winded way of saying um, banks, balance sheet, not yet, but stay tuned. Let's see how this evolves. Okay, good answer. Um, thinking about affordability, um, but thinking about this new technology, I want to ask Adrian specifically, because Supernal has a mission to provide EV tolls that are achievable, accessible, affordable for all. Now, can you elaborate on the infrastructure and support that would be required to help achieve that mission? Yeah, I think um, there's a couple of things that I'll touch on. And one is obviously starting with designing for affordability. So I think baking that into the vehicle design process becomes critically important. Um, if we think about the infrastructure itself, I think, you know, John brought up a really good point about sort of uh, the diversification of revenue sources within these assets. And I think in general, if we can think about co-locating infrastructure around all of these new mobility technologies that are fundamentally converging around the same fundamental tech, right? A lot of that has to do with energy. Um, I think that is one way that you can think about accessibility maybe differently. Um, and think about how do you use these infrastructure assets to provide a multitude of benefits to multiple users, whether that's multiple modes. Um, aviation is going to have high requirements in terms of what the energy requirements are. So we can think about how that contributes to grid resiliency within communities. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I think really multimodal solutions are, are, are going to be key. And I, I think that's true for aviation and a lot of other technologies. The other thing I'll highlight about accessibility um, or two, two other things I'll highlight. I think working really closely, you know, in the same way that Roland was speaking about, community planners, transit planners, elected officials, um, agency officials, they know their communities best and they know where the gaps are. Um, and they know what cannot necessarily be achieved given what they currently have in their portfolio of technology to be able to fill, um, you know, dynamic transportation challenges. And so I think, you know, working very closely with those voices and making sure that that's incorporated into the process um, is key. I think business innovation is key. So we have a longstanding history and multiple modes of transportation where, even you think about the aircraft that some of you took to come to Commotion, part of those seats are paying for a bunch of other seats, right? 
Um, and I think there are different ways that we can think about business model innovation that we probably haven't talked enough about in AEM. Um, and then finally, I'll just uh, capitalize on or uh, sort of point out, I think mode diversity is one way of framing accessibility that we probably don't talk about enough. We're, you know, we're heavily vehicle dependent, personal vehicle dependent in the United States. Um, that can be very exclusionary for a lot of different people for all kinds of reasons, right? Whether that's affordability of the vehicle themselves, whether that's um, you have waning eyesight, you are too young, you're too old, right? I mean, there's a whole lot of complicated factors that impact people's ability to move around. Um, and so I think there's, there's a real opportunity to, to increase modal diversity um, and at the same time, you know, think about how do we provide placemaking, some lower cost infrastructure that connects a couple of different places and, and really give people more options to get around the way that they need to. Uh, excellent answer. And since you sort of led into a next question I had in my mind, I'm going to turn it over to Alex and say, what do you think, particularly about what Adrian was saying in terms of integration, multimodality, um, in terms of the role of the government? So I think it's important, the education piece I think is the most important because we're all talking here and I, I'm not sure that all the elected officials are in tune, aware, what this means, what this could mean for us, how this could change our landscape. Um, so I think the education because ultimately, you know, does this become a policy thing? You know, does, you know, what approvals do we need um, for these things to happen, uh, for the city to be okay to give us a piece of land for us to build this? Um, so, you know, it's almost like you have to have buy-in and I think governments are sometimes behind the time and I think we need to get in front of it, um, which is no different than us changing the, the paradigm on, on who do we bring to the table first. And, and I know we've talked about it, we've discussed it, but utilities have to come to the table too. Um, and so I think sometimes, you know, me on my own, I, I probably can't make, I could make the phone call, but having the support from our elected officials to tell our utility, uh, you know, FPNL, hey, you gotta come to the table, we need you, you know, we wanna build this. Um, and then us do it as a, almost like a consortium, right? Like, a, and, and like you said, a P3. I think that's gonna be very important um, for us to be successful. Can I, can I add one thing there? So it's not only the layer of state and local government you have to deal with here, because air, airspace in the United States is governed by the FAA. Uh, I know the FAA is on board with eVTOL, but I don't believe they've figured out how this increase in aircraft volume is gonna harmoniously work with current traffic, especially in cities where you have obstacles, you have different classes of controlled airspace. So I think that's another layer. So um, another layer of <laughs> bureaucratic red tape that uh, has to be cut through. Very true. And there's, I want to point out to the audience, there's actually a policy discussion on UAM tomorrow at this. So we're really focused on infrastructure. And you had mentioned the P3, the public-private partnership. Um, Generally, how does the panel, I'm sure that we have sort of ranging ideas, which pieces are well equipped for sort of a public position, which pieces of the infrastructure are better suited for private investment? Yeah, I, I'm a firm believer there in the energy component. I mean, I think when you do sort of a P3 analysis, what part of the value chain provides the most benefit to the most people, which is really where public dollars at the end of the day need to be allocated. Um, to me, that the energy piece becomes sort of top of mind and the other sort of aspects that are really catering to AAM itself. Um, you know, we can look at other different types of forms of financing uh, to, to, cover, to cover their costs. What I think is important, and I agree with what Adrian just said, um, that we differentiate while we're talking about this topic is that when we talk about public versus private, uh, there's a difference between um, a publicly funded or privately funded facility, but when we say Private, private vertiport, it does not necessarily mean, it does not mean at all that it's going to be private for a private use or exclusive. It just means that private dollars are coming in to support the building of this infrastructure. And I think all of us here agree that this new mode of transportation needs to bring a public benefit. That's not what we're questioning. You know, we want there to be uh, utilization. We want there to be a, a, a benefit of modality, and that will ensure that uh, there's a successful commercialization, which we all want. We don't want something that isn't gonna work and that people are not gonna use. But 
there is a benefit to bringing private investment, especially in the early days to this, because that's gonna allow the industry to uh, provide the proof that's needed that the uh, AAM industry is viable and valuable. And beyond that, then there could be conversations within a given community as to what we do with tax dollars. I mean, I know that I'm a local resident here, as I mentioned, my, my entire lifetime. And there are other pressing matters that I know that I'd like to make sure that we're funding before we decide that we're going to be dedicating public dollars to building a vertiport. So the fact that we have infrastructure partners, uh, there are more than one of us here, but for Rovio is definitely one of them, that wants to step up to the plate, I think is definitely a plus as we develop these networks in the United States and, and abroad. I'm glad Rolando drew the distinction between public and private. Um, you know, I, I think that if, if you go back in history, when commercial aviation was taking hold, I think that was in the 1920s, I'll bet you that generations ago they were kind of weighing the same things as today. But the fact is it's evolved into all commercial airports are publicly owned. There are certain assets on airport, terminals, et cetera, that are privately owned, but the airport itself is usually publicly owned. Um, I, I think I see, if I go back to the three stages of evolution that I, that I um, believe, I believe this will play out, like I, um, I see existing on airport infrastructure to be, continue to be publicly owned. Um, I think that when you're retrofitting existing assets, especially in cities, usually these are not publicly owned, they're privately owned. Your parking garages, your buildings, et cetera. So I think that's where you're gonna get private ownership. Um, and it's, it's, it's a wild card for the brand new builds. You know, they could be, they probably will, in my opinion, will be publicly owned. You know, there's a certain power behind a municipality when you're raising financing. So if you want to issue bonds on that project and you have a creditworthy obligor backing those bonds, I think you'll get more appetite, lower yields. So I, I think the market will naturally gravitate to that. Uh, this will not be a zero sum game. We see a, an environment in the future where there will be privately funded vertiports, public facilities, public airports, all working with all the different eVTOL operators to serve the general public for all the needs that they have. So I think I, I totally agree with what you said, and it's good that we're all here and that we're all here. I would also just say, I think it's gonna be interesting to see what the evolving role of airport authorities are in these different geographies, right? As you think about having more aviation assets potentially in communities, you know, I think it will vary from place to place, but seeing, um, do they want to roll? What does that scope look like? Um, there's some probably natural fit, you know, that, that comes along with that. Um, but I think that'll be an interesting question, you know, that as we get to that viability and, and the proofing of concepts, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see where, where they decide to sit the, situate themselves sort of in the ownership asset management. So two things came up that caught my attention. So the, the piece about electrification and also, you know, what comes up or these challenges that come out more in situ. So we're all interested in ground and space and urbanity. So how are we planning or what is the thought on making the, the place grid ready? We, have we a sense of how much energy is going to be required and you know, how, what, what do we need to do to support that, especially in spatially constrained compact cities? Well, going back to what Alex said, I think um, the, the most important part is, is engaging our public utilities in Florida. It's Florida Power and Light. Uh, I can say from our side of the table, uh, we've found an engaging partner. We've been in active conversations with them. Um, and uh, as we cite these, then it'll be a, a, a very specific to that location as to what infrastructure they may have. Uh, but they're open to the discussions of if there's sites that do not have the infrastructure, they're being able to bring it in. Now, I know that Alex and I have had lots of conversations about the fact that although we need uh, additional capacity for charging these eVTOL vehicles, we also now are going to be competing with charging for uh, electric vehicles in, in her uh, universe, which is parking. So it, I think it's going back to what I said, collaboration within all the policy and uh, stakeholders for this new modality to make sure that they understand that 
when they're meeting with me that I'm not only looking out for supplying my vertiport, that I also need for them to know that they need to supply Alex's parking garage, which in one given case may be both things, her parking garage and my vertiport. So um, having them as a partner, I think, is, is vital. Yeah, and, and I'd add that if, you know, if, you, if I think the question was how much are the, or, you know, what type of energy needs do we have? Significant, right? Not stuff you could take off the grid today. You're going to have to put substations in. Um, this is, this is going to be a mess that, that people have to solve for. But, but the, the assumption is, is that electric is the fuel of aviation in the future. And I don't, I don't know if I'm 100% sold on that. Because battery density, uh, power density in batteries right now is just not great. And it, it creates a real constraint. You have some early players out there that are dealing with hydrogen, which again is an entirely different issue because now you have to pipe hydrogen around. But I, I think you, if you're making the assumption that aviation, short haul, medium haul, is an electric only play, we're gonna have to really catch up to make that happen. Yeah. I would really definitely emphasize that point and, and say that it's not just for aviation too, right? At the end of the day, we are all trying to rapidly convert a bunch of different forms of transportation to zero emissions. And batteries and all that, it's, it's, it's not gonna do the trick, right? So there's, there's a certain amount of constellation of different types of energy requirements um, or energy sort of uh, power sources. That, um, that I think you have to put together and sort of work as a network in order to, to power the future that we're trying to get to. Um, and then, yeah, we've talked about it, utility planning. If, if you look at zero emissions, sort of fleet conversions plans that have gone on um, at different sort of county agencies, different types of municipal agencies, a lot of it gets hung up because you didn't in, involve the, the utility early enough. So I think, um, yeah, it, early conversations and often. That's why I think that repurposing is, is a lot more difficult concept for even me to wrap my arms around. Um, because I, I do think that even energizing our, our facilities to put um, uh, EV charging stations was, was a, a challenge on its own. And it, and it wasn't for, I wasn't powering so many, I wasn't putting so many in. Um, so just the thought of having to repurpose that to put a vertiport above I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying that there's a lot that comes with that. Um, and there's a lot of money that comes with that. And I, you know, we, I don't think we've, we have wrapped our arms around what that cost could be and what that partnership looks like, if at all. You know, if, is it a partnership where I am providing you the facility and you are you know, doing the rest of it, um, and then the financing comes in play? Are you going to back that? Um, and so because it's our revenue, right, on the public side, and so are you re leveraging my revenue? Can we even do that? Um, so it, it's, it's, it's a bigger conversation, and you're right. The substations we just talked about, um, you know, the city has a mandate where we're electrifying uh, new buildings. 20% of the parking garage has to be electrified. It has to be ready, EV ready. Um, and that in itself takes, we talked about generators, we talked about what does that mean when you're pulling all this power. Um, so it changes a lot. It's, it's a good conversation to start having ahead of time. I could absolutely see us building something new from scratch being easier for me to, to wrap my arms around than, than repurposing something that I already have in a dense urban core. Yeah, if you wanted to charge slow, this wouldn't be an issue, right? This is about DC fast charging. EV toll doesn't work if you have to sit there for 10 hours and charge your battery. Electric vehicles don't work if you can drive them to work and, well, maybe it does work if you can charge them overnight for individual use. But if you think about fleets of trucks and, and you know, aviation in general, this all hinges on the ability to fast charge. So that's what draws the ton of power. I mean, I'd be interested in, Rolando, your perspective on this, but I think at the end of the day, you know, we talk about bankability. How do we make these line items balance out and, um, you know, Energy tends to be the most cost variable, hardest to predict, right? And um, most expensive line item in a lot of these electrification projects overall. And so how that ends up impacting maybe the way that the network comes together, site feasibility, et cetera, I, mean, I think that's an important conversation to, to have as, as we think about demand and also where can you feasibly actually get these so that they're not so expensive uh, to, to develop. Well, that'll be crucial as, as we discussed in the conversation we had previously we agree that uh, a way that we make sure that these things are uh, uh, successful is we have to make sure that we build them 
efficiently, effectively, and, and you know, make sure that it, it's not costing a, a gazillion dollars to build because if the capital expenditure going in is that high, we're going to have to pass that on to somebody. So making sure that we are building um, facilities in our communities that are palatable and beautiful but not expensive is crucial, and electrification will be part of that. If we're at a location that already has the infrastructure, that's great. Now, if it's not, then it's going to be a discussion with the utility of, well, this is important for you. Who's going to bear that cost? And I think, like I said, it maybe isn't a discussion that's been had fully, but uh, I know that the, the preliminary conversations that we had with FPNL, they seem like a very uh, participative uh, partner in this. So I, I'm encouraged by the conversations that we've had so far. That was a really good lead in. So affordability is one issue, but it does go hand in hand with equity. So especially with the reuse of space versus maybe placing a greenfield site. So what are the, some of the, like, the design and infrastructure considerations around really equitable placement of vertiports? And maybe we'll start at that end and work this way. But. Well, I think, as I've mentioned previously, um, for Rural VLCs, all these facilities being agnostic, and as I mentioned already, having a public benefit as it relates to be, being equitably, equitably distributable, um, what we need to seek in a nascent industry and in something that's being built out is, like I said, that it's usable and that it's sustainable. So we need to, I think, first crawl, then walk, then run. And in order for that to happen, we need to, as we are doing internally, do modeling to see where there's going to be a big push for people using these. And when we build them, um, going back to the, the point that Adrian and I discussed last week, making sure that we're making them cost effective, but we also make, need to make sure that we break the mold, uh, John, of the typical airport uh, use. It's not going to be a big terminal where we're going to be spending hours and we want to have a meal. It's going to be somewhere that is easy to get into, easy to check in, and easy to walk out, get in, and take off. And so I think there's a lot of, of, of I'm going to use the word that Alex used earlier, education that needs to be done to stakeholders, to the people that are participating and building these out, and to the community to understand that this truly is a new day in transportation. So that would be my answer to that. Yeah, no, those are all really, really good points. I think a um, couple of things I'll say, I think equity can apply in the context of we should think about who the users and the non-users are, right? And there's role, you know, in every transportation innovation, you have to think about both, anything, anytime you're disrupting. Um, and, you know, what value are you providing, maybe from an economic opportunity, jobs, et cetera. Um, I always think that's one critical piece. Um, the other that I'll also bring up is I think, you know, I talked to a, a, an MPO recently, and they were looking at going after different smart grants and planning grants that, that are being made available. And I thought they made a really great point in saying that, you know, they're trying to take a proactive stance in securing those types of dollars so that they can actually put that capital in the places where they don't think private capital is going to flock to first, right? And so one way of, I think, thinking about equity is, you know, how do we sort of make the most of the dollars that, that are at the table? Um, you know, cap, private capital will go to some places initially, right, but before it goes to others. And um, I think having really strategic conversations and making sure that industry partners are supporting those efforts um, and are, you know, probably thinking differently about sort of the narrative, you know, try, trying to think creatively about what does that business model actually look like and, and how do these use cases apply to, to a vast, um, you know, a, a diverse group of people I think is gonna, gonna end up being critical. Great, and Alex, you're probably another, a natural lead in on that question. Um, yeah, um, equity is very important and it's, it's become, I think, even more prevalent after, you know, and after and during the pandemic, right? Um, and so I, for me as a public entity, it was very important. My first conversations were very driven towards, you know, one company and, you know, one, one use and and that has really migrated and as I think that some of these vertebral companies have also shifted their idea of maybe only coupling with one person or one uh, entity then to have it open and I think as a public entity I need to make it open for all to use um, there are 
many uses for a vertiport. It could be, it could carry cargo, it could carry two people, it could carry five people, it could be, you know, I'm sure that there are going to be many companies who may be more cost effective than others. And I think we need to ha be open to having all of them use a vertiport that's provided by a public entity like mine. And so I always want to be open and, and provide that option for the public. Um, and, you know, we have to also see what that, what does that mean for us? Is there going to be a, a revenue? What's the return on investment? And what are we doing with that money? Are we put, pumping it back um, into the community? And how are we doing that? Are we going to use that money to provide back, um, to give people an, 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 an option to then take um, this mode of transportation to get to where they have to go to. So all that has to be still, flush, you know, flushed out. And, but I do think that that is important. We play an important key to making that happen and having those discussions with the private entity, especially if we do a P3. And so John, I was also thinking about, like, from a banking perspective, through vigils and vertiports, is there a way to amplify disadvantaged communities through financing in this space? I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, I was just thinking about, in terms of the equity piece, you know, really going to fund new vertiports in places that have been underserved by other transportation modes historically. Um, I, don't, I don't know if, if I necessarily agree with that, because if, if I view this as volume wanting to get to areas that people do travel to, if you're drawing the assumption that it will decrease property values, let's say, in a certain area, no. Um, I think, I think the, the, the way to solve what you're saying is that if this is only benefiting part of the population of a city, let's say, and we want to uh, level the playing field for those that maybe can't afford something like this, because I think initially this will be expensive. Not everyone uses taxis, right? Um, I think you do that through a tax scheme. I think that you, you, have, you have to take uh, some equating measure from a tax perspective. Okay, well, I believe we have some time for audience questions in our panel. Just uh, before we get to that, I wanted to open the panel. Any final remarks or things you'd like to share? Exciting. Well, I mean, if I'm gonna take the opportunity just to thank uh, the commotion organizers and all our elected officials for being here, for allowing us to have this conversation, which is so important to our community and to the success of this industry uh, in our county, in our city, and in our state. Uh, I want to thank you all for being so open to having this, this dialogue, and I think we're, we're moving the ball. So thank you so much. I also, I will say, this is my third year here in Miami presenting, and our first conversation was so far away from what we were having today, and I think that next year we'll have even a better conversation, and in the years to come, he would have financed already a couple of these, and you know, um, you know, the vertiports will be built, and and I think we're going to get there. I, I do think that if we continue to be leaders, we will, and hopefully you guys will be able to visit one um, here in Miami. So thank you for coming today to this session. Yeah, I'll just echo the sentiment. Thanks to Commotion, I feel like they've always done a great job of highlighting so many disruptive innovations, um, including in aviation. And, and it's great to be here and, and be able to be part of the event. And then I would also like to say, you know, I, I feel like with both the city of Miami and Miami-Dade County, you know, both have been really forward-leaning in this topic and, and I think really tried to drive a dialogue and engage a lot of different stakeholders along in that process. And um, those are invaluable learning opportunities, I think, on both sides. And, and so really do appreciate all of the sort of forward-thinking activities that are going on here. And Carrie, thank you for moderating. And welcome back to Florida, by the way. She's uh, thank you, had been here in 10 years. Yeah. I also wanted to say thank you to our panelists. I mean, each of us is working to strive to make a sustainable urban air mobility system from a different discipline. But I want to thank our panelists for actually moving the needle and making this change possible. It's exciting. Thank you, Commotion, and our audience. But we do have time. Um, would we like an audience question? And anybody's welcome to go up to that mic. Or if you're a teacher like I am, you can just project. Uh, whatever works. Over here, yes. Hello, it's Steve Morello, uh, CDM Smith. I'd like to ask the question, who's going to win? Dubai announced in April of 2023 that they will be starting EV toll flights, commercial flights, in 2026. Is Florida going to beat them, or are they going to be second in that race? 
Well, I mean, I guess I'll jump in and answer this question. Um, I think what is going to determine that first and foremost is certification. So right now, all of the aircraft is being certified. We are all working under the impression that they will be certified by 26. And if they are certified by 26, there will be a Ferrovial Vertiport operating in Florida by then. Before then, I'll say, actually. I'll chime in and just say, as it pertains to infrastructure, I do think, you know, regula densely regulated markets versus markets that are not necessarily densely regulated in the same way, where maybe you have more opportunity to do experimentation, I, I do think that's going to be, a, you know, an influencing factor along with the aircraft certification process. I personally think you'll see it in the freight market earlier than 26. I think you'll see it in the armed forces significantly before that because they don't have an FAA certification process. Um, but it does hinge on FAA cert progress. All right. Um, I think we're actually at 310, which is our session time. This clock is not correct. So thank you all for coming. Uh, if you have other questions, our panel will be around. You're welcome to come chat with us. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Really Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you.